Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Building Resilience, a Glimpse into the Future of Energy Modelling. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Fiona MacDonald, and I'm an Innovations Manager at Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. I'm delighted to be joined today by Joe Clark of University of Strathclyde and Stuart McPherson, um, President of SIBSI, to lead on today's presentations. Um, we then have uh, the support of a number of industry partners, um, that have been involved in our project uh, to support a panel session in, uh, later in, in today's event. That includes uh, Parag uh, Rastogi from Ar Arbinco, Laurie McElroy from University of Strathclyde, Richard Atkins from Home Data, Scott Restrick from e EAS, and Don Daniel Fields from um, Harley Palmer Flat. Um, before we get underway, I would like uh, to just highlight some housekeeping points um, just to make sure that the webinar runs as smoothly as possible. Firstly, the session has been recorded today and presentations will be available um, after the event. Uh, all participants will be on mute for the duration of the webinar, but I do encourage you to ask questions throughout. So please do quick click on in the questions tab um, within the uh, control panel, type in your question and press send. That way we'll have them all lined up for the, the panel session later on. Um, your feedback and opinions are extremely important to us. Um, so if you don't, if we don't have the time to answer all of the questions today, please rest assured we'll try our best to do the appropriate follow up and meet everyone's expectations and get you an appropriate response. So I appreciate that some of you may not be aware um, of what we do at Construction Scotland's Innovation Centre. Uh, so I thought it would be useful just to give you a quick outline um, with regards to some of the work that we do. Um, and, and then in turn that offers some context as to how this collaboration uh, with the University of Strathclyde, SIBSI, uh, RIAS and our industry support partners uh, were established to deliver this project. So I'll just start with the presentation. Hopefully you can all see that. So Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. Um, oops, sorry. Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. Um, we are what, a part of the Innovation Centre's initiative set up by Scottish Government, Scottish Funding Council and um, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Uh, we are one of a family of innovation centres throughout Scotland, but as you can see from um, the, the sister organisations that we work with, we are the only innovation centre that is specialist within the built environment. That's not to say that we don't um, dip our toe into other areas, for example, industrial biological with iBioIC or um, sensor support with Census or the big data themes within Data Lab. We do work very collaboratively, but our focus is very much so on the construction industry. Our remit across all the innovation centres is very much so about connecting universities and colleges with our, with our industry partners. And in relation to some of the projects we've delivered, you can see some of the headline impacts that we've made through the delivery of our projects to date, um, namely um, the number of jobs safeguarded and created um, are some of our bigger successes, but the additional revenue and cost savings is, is equally as impactful. We have four industries, uh, four areas um, that are aligned to zero carbon outcomes um, that we like to focus our efforts on. Um, culture change, digital transformation, accelerating industrialization and building sustainably. We feel that these themes really help drive innovation in the most appropriate um, direction in terms of return on investment through economic impact for government investment. We do this through four core activities, um, namely through our connected ecosystem, which is very much so the events like these, how we can partner and uh, build collaborations uh, from grassroots levels. The collaborative projects, which is very uh, much so the kind of backbone of the existence of this project, whereby we support innovation through buying out academic expertise um, um, which with, a, with a view that industry projects are, are driving the return on investment. The Innovation Factory, which is a facility that we have out in Blantyre, um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a more um, a more appropriate image of that in one moment. A future skills, it's very much so about you know um, disturbing how we deliver skills uh, within our environment, acknowledging um, how we can do it more flexibly, how we can do it with um, more scale, and, and introducing new technologies for that for a greater impact. This is an innovation centre and is very much so dedicated to the, digital, uh, the manufacturing and, and digitising construction with a, with a view to um, offering a facility for future skills and training. Um, so you can see that um, this is a facility for, that we encourage um, access to, to support not just this um, 
projects from an off-site level, but training and digitising process as well. So the Building Resilience Project, um, oh, sorry, I just wanted to um, offer a bit of a, an introduction before we uh, hand you over to um, to Stuart McPherson, the, the president of SIPSI. Um, now that I've offered a little context uh, for those who were unaware of CSIC, our ambitions um, very much so around the collaboration for the industry between academia, uh, the uh, uh, academia, our industry partners, and so forth. But in short, um, this is project for us was very much so about using state of the art um, software. Um, building performance simulation to establish software prototype for the standardised uh, testing of operational resilience uh, for new build and refurbishment projects. So the project has been very well supported by a range of partners, that have, um, some of whom are, are, are on our panel today. Um, but, you know, the, throughout the delivery, CSIC has really been um, it's the industry involvement on this side of things, it's the collaboration and the opportunities for industry adoption to take this, uh, this project and its outcomes to the next level. And that's very much so why we're here today. So from more of a technical uh, point of view, which is absolutely not my uh, expertise, um, I'm just going to hand you over now to Stuart McPherson, President of SIPSI, um, to give you a more um, in-depth look at actually how we implemented the delivery of this project to this extent at this stage. Stuart, can I pass you over? Thank you, Fiona. Good morning, all. Colleagues listening who are involved in building design and in their ongoing operation will know that there is a well-known phenomenon in our industry called the performance gap. Designers will use, in many instances, relatively sophisticated dynamic simulation software to model the performance of a building, usually in environmental and energy terms. Yet, we know that the actual performance of buildings in operation can vary quite considerably from the predictions of these models. There are potentially many reasons for this. Some of these reasons are quite straightforward. For instance, a building modelled on a standard 8 a.m. Uh, to 7 p.m. five day a week occupancy pattern actually turns out to be occupied 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or the occupancy density of the building as modelled during the design phase turns out to be only two thirds of the actual occupancy density. But there are also other less obvious reasons for deviations between model performance and actual performance that are harder to pin down. Typically, when we model the performance of buildings at the design stage, we do so on a standardized basis. This is generally because we want to get a measure of its environmental performance and its energy performance and CO2 emissions as compared against a benchmark of some sort. What matters to us most when approaching the problem from that angle is how we do against the benchmark. We will use standardised weather data to simulate a typical year. We will assume that our building occupants behave rationally in accordance with standard patterns. We will assume that our systems are controlled correctly and our plant and equipment always performs to specification. Although we may use dynamic simulation to model our designs, it is in fact a pretty static kind of dynamic simulation when you think of it. Suppose we get a beast from the east and the temperature does not rise above minus six for two weeks. Suppose one of the air conditioning chillers breaks down in our office building during a heat wave. Suppose your two bedroom social housing flat is occupied by a single pensioner for a few years, and then by a working couple, and then by a couple with two children. How do our building designs cope with the events that life will throw at them? Now, I hear the designers listening cry, you can't expect a building to cope as designed with extreme events being thrown at it. If we designed to cope with every conceivable extreme, then we would be over-designing, and that in itself is inefficient and wasteful of resources. Some things you just can't plan for. Well, yes and no. Yes, it is reasonable to design to, it is not reasonable to design to extremes, but we all know that there are features of our buildings that make some designs more robust than others and able to cope better with unexpected events or changes in circumstances. We also know that some designs are more sensitive 
to things going wrong than others. Buildings that have relatively low tech systems and good passive performance tend to have in-use energy consumption that is closer to the model predictions than buildings that rely on complex services systems with finely tuned controls that can quite easily get out of tune. Wouldn't it be good if somehow it was possible to simulate the life of a building, not just in an idealized design year, but over a much longer time period where, within reason, it has to suffer these slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. There would be some extreme weather events. There would be some changes in occupancy patterns. Things would occasionally go wrong, like a power cut or a boiler failure. And wouldn't it be good if it were possible to get some kind of criterion on how the building was able to cope with these things so that we could define what constituted good, resilient responses and what indicated that the design was too sensitive to disruptive events. This was essentially the proposal that Joe Clark put to us a couple of years ago. The idea that we could set up a long-term simulation environment that would impose on a stochastic basis certain stressors on the building and monitor the building response against an agreed statistical set of criteria and provide a result that the building had passed or failed our tests, and if it had failed, where it had failed. An evolution of this could be a standardized test environment and set of protocols that would be the foundation of a new resilience standard. We talk about resilient buildings, resilient communities and resilient cities, and qualitatively, we have a loose understanding of what we mean by that. But there are no current standards for resilience testing, so that such testing, where it's done at all, is ad hoc and implemented as an arbitrary function of the project context. The result is that it's impossible to compare alternative proposals in terms of the performance that is likely to be realized in practice. This project was conceived by Joe, aimed to utilize state-of-the-art building simulation to establish a software prototype for the standard testing of operational resilience for new build and refurbishment proposals. It set out to provide a new capability of life cycle performance assessment. The industry partners would take the lead in defining the context of the performance assessments required for each building type including those events that are likely to adversely affect operational resilience. The industrial partners would then go on to provide exemplar projects on which to test the system and ensure that the approach was realistic. At the beginning of the project, I will admit that there was some scepticism on my part as to how viable the concept would be. It seemed to me too great a leap to go from the current state of knowledge on simulation to a perpetual simulation incorporating stressors which would test buildings under different stochastically imposed conditions against degree standards. I also wondered about the amount of effort required by those using the testing environment in creating the models to submit for testing in the first instance. This needed to be reasonable. If the models required to be too detailed in the earlier stages of design, then this would be a barrier to the uptake of the resilience testing concept. The challenge for the prototype resilience testing platform was to demonstrate that, at least in these early stages, it appeared that the key objectives could be met and that we could see our way to this becoming a workable tool for practitioners. I'm pleased now to hand over to Joe, who will explain how his team at Strathclyde University rose to that challenge. My name is Joe Clark, and this presentation reports the outcome from a recently completed project funded by the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre and involving several industry partners, as identified later, supported by my research group based at the University of Strathclyde. The aim of the project was to develop a building resilience test method based on standardized and automated simulation procedures. The 
The context of the project is the exploration of options for low energy design, some of which are listed here relating to building design features and various technologies for the provision of low carbon heat and power. While some of these options are complementary, others are mutually exclusive or require careful blending, as with, for example, different facade technologies or the distribution of authority in smart control systems. This situation has led to a growth in complexity that is contributing to a performance gap between design intent on the one hand and attainment of aspiration on the other. Unfortunately, simplified modeling tools and procedures for legislative compliance are unable to adequately represent this complexity and can therefore worsen the situation. What is needed is a way to assess life cycle performance in a realistic, straightforward and consensus manner. Building and systems performance simulation has the potential to provide this capability and thereby offer a solution to the performance gap dilemma. The core strength of the approach is its ability to respect a system's thermodynamic integrity and thereby enable an emulation of reality as distinct from merely calculating some property of a proposal under contrived operating conditions. Shown here are four intrinsic aspects of a building that need to be respected. First, there is the time variation of the myriad energy transfers, with processes varying at different rates. Second, there is the dependence of the design parameters on the evolving system state. Such parameters cannot be known in advance, and concepts such as U values, equipment efficiencies, air change rates and the like are at best outputs, never inputs. Third, there are the interactions between system parts that must be considered holistically. Some typical uh, parts are shown here. And fourth, there is the stochastic nature of influences associated with weather, occupant behaviour and equipment failure. While simulation tools encapsulating these aspects have been under development for several decades, their application in practice remains ad hoc and places a significant time burden on users. These were the two issues addressed in the resilience testing project. This shows the project partners covering domestic and commercial buildings health care, care facilities, community energy schemes, facilities management, building standards, fuel poverty, professional practice and software development. The lead partner in the project was SIBSI. Also shown is a summary of the main project aims. To agree performance assessment procedures, performance acceptability criteria, and resilience impacting events for different building types and levels of performance expectation. To incorporate these procedures and criteria in a resilience testing environment or RTE and field trial this on live projects and to pass the open source RTE prototype to SIBZ for further scrutiny, refinement and deployment as a possible way forward for the harmonization of simulation program application in the construction industry. This slide summarizes the components of the RTE, progressing clockwise from the top left. Some design intent is expressed in the form of a computer model that is uploaded to a server along with the required resilience tests. At the present time, this model adheres to the input requirement of the simulation program that powers the RTE, but with parts of the model generated automatically where possible to reduce the burden on the user. 
It is expected that the model format will be generalized as and when the BIM standard evolves to cover all data requirements of performance simulation. The uploaded model is then subjected to perpetual annual simulations, test-specific stressor events imposed. The evolving simulation results are constantly probed and transformed to performance metrics relating to comfort, air quality, energy, and emissions. The process is suspended when the proposal either fails or passes the acceptability criteria. In the latter case, a compliance certificate is issued and the uh, corresponding model archived. In the former case, a revised model may be uploaded and the test recommenced. The RTE is an open source application that is designed to be powered by any approved simulation tool, presently ESPR. The benefit of the approach is that the user does not require knowledge of the underlying simulation program or expertise in approaches to dynamic performance assessment. By standardizing performance assessments, the RTE enables direct and unambiguous comparison between alternative design proposals. The intention is to match resilience tests to different application targets and increasing levels of performance stringency, such as the example shown here for housing, where tests progress from a basic standard to, to net zero energy. The acceptability of any program as a core simulation engine for the RTE will depend on its ability to handle each application target and provide the required test levels. Because it is likely that some programs will offer only partial test coverage pending the implementation of new functionality, it is envisaged that the RTE will serve as an integration framework for programs of disparate capability. To enable uh, reality emulation, the RTE requires a high resolution input model. For example, the model of a dwelling shown here comprises variable hydrothermal properties, stochastic occupant behavior, contents and furnishings, heating system, integrated renewables, air and electricity flow networks, air movement domains, and distributed control. The point to stress is that it is possible for program developers to automate the imposition of many of these features as long as consensus prescriptions can be agreed. For example, ESPR is able to automatically generate airflow networks and gridded CFD domains after a building's geometry, construction and systems have been specified. The outcome from the simulation of such a high resolution model is a realistic insight into overall performance as it evolves over time. Six examples are shown here relating to thermal comfort, thermal bridge avoidance, air quality, control dynamics, clean combustion and power quality. Within the RTE, such results are not output but probed continuously, transformed to aggregate performance indicators and assessed against agreed acceptability criteria. For example, results relating to the temporal and spatial distribution of indoor conditions, as shown in this animated image, would be transformed to relevant metrics for thermal comfort and the frequency of occurrence of unacceptable high or low temperatures. While the acceptability of energy use would be determined by comparing disaggregated data against established benchmarks or targets. As another example, here is a high resolution model of a commercial building uh, comprising descriptions of control, lighting, HVAC, electrical, 
occupant behavior and air movement. Realistic performance insights from such a model can be automatically and continuously assessed against national or international standards relating to thermal comfort, visual comfort and air quality as shown here. The RTE prototype has been named Marathon to reflect the perpetual and comprehensive nature of the simulations it undertakes. It comprises a user interface and remote server communicating via a SQL database. The front end employs the PHP server scripting language. The server comprises two fast processors with significant RAM. This slide shows the RTE model upload page, which supports the management of multiple models and model variants as generated by a registered user. This slide shows the next step in the process, associating a resilience test with a model. The intention here is that the entries shown for a particular test are those agreed by consensus and therefore will not generally be editable by individual users. Typically, a single resilience test will require a simulation that takes from several hours to several days to complete. So while there is no limit to the number of tests that can be requested, actual test scheduling will depend on the server capacity and load. This slide shows the results dashboard, which indicates the status of each resilience test as passed to the server. Depending on the test outcome, several options are offered, including the download of summary or detailed feedback, or the uploading of a revised model. Where a test completes successfully, a compliance certificate is issued. So in conclusion, a prototype resilience testing environment has been developed and field tested in collaboration with industry partners. While presently powered by the open source ESPR program, the RTE is designed to be program agnostic so that, that it may be powered by a number of accredited programs. Automated life cycle performance assessments have been demonstrated, including the ability to impose random system stressors, such as power outage, shading device failure, or equipment breakdown. Field trials address domestic, commercial, and district heating proposals at various stages of development. The intention now is to establish a SIBZ working group to take the RTE concept forward in consultation with the wider industry. Thank you. Yep, if everyone in the panel could um, um, unmute and add their cameras, we can get the, the Q&A session started. So I do have some questions here already from, uh, from event participants, so uh, just to get the ball rolling, and these will continue to flow through to me. So anyone that's still in line with the event, please don't hesitate to send through questions um, and we'll answer as many as, as we can. Um, so I, I guess really just starting from the top and some of the questions that come through, um, and it's not for anyone in particular, uh, but perhaps Stuart, you could start us off by um, you know, what types of problems should uh, the RTP address? Uh, where is it most appropriate? Okay. Um, well, actually, the, it's, a, it's a great shame that Joe wasn't able to complete his presentation and everyone could understand it. And perhaps, actually, before I go on to answer a particular question, would it be useful if I just perhaps filled in some of the main gaps I could imagine people in their own minds would have before we uh, before we try to answer some questions? Please do. Um, sure. So uh, I set the scene for this earlier on when I I set out Joe, the essence of Joe's proposal: this uh, perpetual simulation environment that would throw things at the building, not ridiculous things, but things that in everyday friction and stitching happens to buildings, causes them to perform in ways which are not ideal, 
Um, the question then is, how big is the deviation from ideal performance when these things happen? Uh, and is your building design overly sensitive to relatively, not, not necessarily extreme events, but just things that happen, which we all know as designers and building operators happen all the time, stuff breaks down, we get the odd extreme weather event, that kind of thing. How does your building actually perform in those circumstances? And if people behave in the building differently to the idealized uh, model uh, used in the uh, initial simulation predictions, again, how does that impact the uh, performance of the building? That tends to sound as though the focus of the project was on energy and environmental performance, and indeed that does tend to be the focus of most simulation. However, the interesting thing about this project was uh, that uh, Joe introduced a whole series of other things into the simulating environment, which generally speaking is not done. So for example, or at least it's not done as an integrated performance assessment, it's done separately uh, as, a, as, a, as a completely separate event. So for example, uh, the incidence of glare coming in through sunlight through windows, um, the, uh, in, the indoor air quality, uh, as a result of people not opening windows as you might expect them to, or not opening the trickle vents as you might expect them to. You know, things like that were also possible to model. And I was really quite surprised at the uh, number of things that it was possible to introduce into this simulation to give a more rounded, um, a more rounded uh, picture of the performance of the building as a whole. Uh, so it wasn't all just about energy and CO2 emissions. It was about many other aspects of building performance, uh, conceivably that could be added into this testing environment and modelled, uh, and and in the end given some uh, score or pass fail criterion. Um, and I felt that that addressed something which I was concerned about as a building designer and as a president of of Simsy. Um, that we, we did, we we have a tendency in our industry to become fixated on certain things because they are the thing we're supposed to be looking at primarily at the moment. CO two emissions, for example, and there are potential dysfunctional outcomes of focusing too much on certain things, uh, where other things start to suffer as a result. So you get very very well insulated buildings, and we all know the school buildings that were constructed. Uh, about 15 years ago, where they have superb energy performance if you are focused on their winter heating requirement, but there was significant overheating problems in many of them that had to be addressed retrospectively because the eye was on not the wrong ball, but perhaps only one ball when the eye should have been on several. Um, so the other thing that was introduced to this project was uh, a more rounded assessment, a potential more rounded assessment of buildings where lots of other things were introduced as well as simply looking at the energy performance of the building and the way we tend. Um, and I thought that was an extremely interesting development and one which is not infinitely expandable, but, but certainly has potential to evolve um, as the appetite in the industry uh, looks for other other ways in which buildings are assessed and a more rounded holistic assessment of the performance of the building more than just the usual things we tend to focus on. So uh, I, I, we didn't quite get to that in, in those presentations and I wanted to make it clear that that is possible and was, at least as a proof of concept was demonstrated in this project you could add in these things into your simulation environment and, mo and model them. Uh, the other interesting thing which Joe was mentioning was, uh, and again it ties in more to the carbon agenda, was the performance of on-site renewable generation technology, battery storage, all these other things which we are very interested in now in looking at community scale development and city scale development and resilience at those scales. Um, the uh, ability to model realistically uh, how the grid would respond to the inputs from the energy available uh, from PV panels on a whole group of buildings, for example, at a particular point in time. There's a potential to do that in this environment also. Uh, uh, you could then look at the effect of battery storage, the effect of vehicle charging uh, in electric vehicles, this kind of stuff. That is, again, potentially expandable from the uh, modeling environment that Joe has created here. And you can look at that not over again some idealized annual scenario, but you can look at what happens if there is a power failure, an outage of the grid. What happens to these buildings under those circumstances? 
what happens if you have a heat wave and there's a peak in the demand from air conditioning in a city centre? These kind of things. As we go to heat pumps, how do air source heat pumps perform when the temperature outside is minus six for two weeks? You know, so these are very interesting questions, which are a more holistic, long-term dynamic simulation model of this kind that can throw these um, slightly unexpected stochastic events at the model and see how it performs over a prolonged period of time, I think is an extremely interesting development uh, and one that one that everyone in the industry should be interested in. And, um, and we should be uh, interested to see what the next steps are in the evolution of this, because we just have got a, a proof of concept model at this stage called Marathon. Um, the interesting thing then, and part of the reason for this, uh, for this event and inviting the kind of people along to it that we have is just to explore what practitioners feel might be the potential for this and how you, they think they could best make use of this modeling environment if it were to be available in some fashion and how would it best be made available to people? Well, that's, that's interesting. I'll plug in one of the questions that you made. Uh, many benchmarks over the years, such as Sipsi Guide F, are based on studies from over 20 years ago. Uh, to provide a closer guide to model results, what Sipsi publication would have the more current set of benchmarks? That's one of the questions we've received from the audience. Uh, yes, uh, guilty as charged to some extent. Um, it's quite hard to keep up to date uh, with these. The, the, the benchmarks are reviewed periodically. It's a big task, however, uh, and uh, it, it has to be fitted into a work stream uh, along with loads of other things that SIBSI is trying to do and lots of other publications that it's trying to, to get out. Uh, but yes, we are conscious it's an extremely fast moving environment, energy performance of buildings and the benchmarks that go along with them. The technical standards in Scotland and the uh, approved documents in England and Wales are reviewed very frequently uh, in energy terms, probably more frequently than most other sections. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yes, the bar keeps getting moved quite rightly um, and the energy benchmarks need to move with them. Uh, but it has to be borne in mind, of course, that the energy benchmarks produced are not just about new buildings conforming to the latest standards. They also have to apply to existing buildings. Uh, one, of our, one of our big challenges in the industry is the refurbishment market. Uh, we only replace the building stock at roughly the rate of 1% per annum. And so clearly, uh, and also, of course, it's not the same 1% that get replaced either. You don't replace 100% of your buildings in 100 years. Um, you, you, we have many sensitive historic buildings, for example, uh, which are, uh, are not subject to refurbishment much at all. Um, so we've got a problem with our existing building stock that needs to be addressed. It's the bigger part of the problem than the new builds and how we can go about addressing the refurbishment of our existing buildings. Um, some, some being very hard to treat because of the sensitivity historically in particular um, is, a, is, a, is a live question. And so again, benchmarks need to be applied to those kinds of things as well. Now this uh, uh, dynamic simulation environmental testing uh, uh, platform, uh, which we've just been discussing, can be applied to retrofit as well as new build. I mean, it, it's, it's a simulation tool which will take any building uh, how, how, however it's constructed and it will simulate it and it will tell you uh, what its performance is like over a prolonged period of time with these random events being thrown at it. Uh, that can apply to any building type. So for example, if you're approaching an historic building refurbishment and you have certain options as to what you might do to this building in order to try to improve its energy performance, for instance, um, then it would be possible to model alternative um, technologies, alternative approaches to insulation and so on, and just see which of those might be the more robust way to proceed. Um, okay. So I, I, I've kind of expanded on the question a little bit over the specific point about the benchmarks, but the, but the, the original question, yes, is understood and we know that it's necessary to keep updating those benchmarks and it's, it's a work in progress and always will be. Yeah, we've targeted. Um, Perhaps one for you, Daniel. Um, how can life cycle performance acceptability be accessed? Yeah, there's always a 
it's always a difficult one. I know, sort of following off what Stuart said, um, it, it's, it's something that certainly with SIPSI guides, um, when, when we start looking at life cycle assessment, we, we tend to go to SIPSI guide M. Um, I think Stuart mentioned there things within SIPSI guides, they, they do take time to keep up, but I think this, this particular guide is fairly consistent. Um, and certainly with this, with this model, we, we were working on the district heating side of things. So we've got a um, Strathclyde's district heating system that, that was the, the niche aspect of this, this particular project we were working on. Um, and that, that was the guy that we, we, we went to. Um, I think, to be honest, if this is opened up to the market, other documents can be brought forward or um, highlighted, but that's certainly from the aspect that we, that we were taking. Um, putting SIPC guide and benchmark benchmarks into the model um, and, and if a failure was highlighted then then the model itself fails um, from our from our perspective um, question for Richard uh, regarding performance gap between simulated energy use and actual operational energy use the design intent seems to be lost in a design and build contract since multiple consultants are involved how do you bridge this gap in a project with a DMB contract? Uh, well, I think it's a, uh, a great question. Uh, I wish I had a simple and easy answer to that. Um, I, I, I think just before I answer that, picking up on one of the points that um, Stuart's making about benchmarks. Um, again, we have to remember that benchmarks not only vary with age and type of construction, but the occupancy, the, the point that Stuart was making right at the, the beginning of the presentation, whereas the technical standards relate very much to a non-dynamic steady state of, of occupancy, whether that's in housing through SAP or whether that's through uh, non-domestic buildings in SBEM. So, yeah, very, very difficult to draw a parallel or a linear connection between what you might do for compliance with what might actually happen in the real world. Um, in terms of how you uh, bridge the performance gap, I mean, it's not just a design and build contracts, that happens in traditional contracts. With design and build, of course, it's, it's considerably more difficult because unlike a traditional contract where the client and their design team are fully in charge of the intent of the design and, and you know, produce vast amounts of information, the contractor then just delivers that design, no doubt with some variations throughout the process with design and build up the, the 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 whole point of a contract like that is to try and describe the output uh which then gives the contracting entity the opportunity to present different proposals so you therefore have to come up with a way of of defining very closely what it is that you're expecting to get and how you're going to measure it and of course that comes neatly round to a whole in a nice little circle which explains why why the value of of, of uh, resilience testing is so great at the moment we don't have the tools to really assess the design intent, uh, intent and then compare it with performance uh, when it's completed and take into account the impact of weather in that particular year or occupation in that building as it happens to be rather than it was uh, expected to be um, so I think there's Using the resilience tool, potentially I could see a way of that being built into contractual arrangements. We're not obviously quite there yet. There's a lot of there's a lot of testing, a lot of work to do to to work out exactly how that might happen. But yeah, no easy no easy answer. But I see Stuart has his hand up. Stuart, would you like to add anything? Yes, I was just going to add that uh, clearly, if you if you model a particular building design especially at quite an early stage and you conclude that it's a good resilient design let's suppose we leap forward to a day where perhaps this resilience testing environment actually turns into a standard and we get a badge as to how resilient our building design is the question what's behind the question is yes but what then if a design and build contractor takes that design and changes it because they they are not following entirely the philosophy set down by the original concept well, one answer to that could be that contractually you have said, look, our concept design has this badge. It has this certain resilience performance standard. That is what we want as an output of this project. 
So it could be, for example, that you might say to a design build contractor, yes, of course, the nature of this contract allows you to put forward alternatives and to achieve things in a different way. But the resilience performance test is not negotiable. It, it may meet it in a different way, but it still has to meet it. So, for example, you might conceivably say to a contractor, if they are going to change the design in some what you think is material way, which may threaten its resilience, then resubmit it. Remodel it and resubmit it for the test and demonstrate that it still achieves the same resilience that we set out to. Uh, another question here from the audience, uh, could a building's resilience to non-energy related events be tested, for example, by evacuation? Any panel members like to pick that one up? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite catch the end of the, the, the question. Could a building's resilience to non-energy related events be tested, for example, by evacuation? I think that might be one for Stuart or Joe. Stuart? I'll, I'll just pick up first thing, Joe. I'm sure Joe could come in. It, the answer is conceivably yes. I mean, I, I think something like fire evacuation was not specifically looked at at all in, in this project. But as I mentioned in um, when I was sort of doing a bit of a catch up for Joe there, the, um, the, we did not, the, the focus of this modeling exercise was not just energy. Energy was part of it. but it was also demonstrated that it was possible to model other things like indoor air quality, glare from sunlight coming through windows, um, and various other things like that, and that there was no particular reason why it would not be possible to evolve the, the simulation environment to include other things. Um, I, I'm not an expert on the fire evacuation part of it. Uh, maybe Joe could pick that up, but. I suppose it seems to me that, yes, I think probably you could, is the answer, uh, but Joe would be better qualified on that one. Okay. I think Joe's offline just because of his microphone just now, but I'll certainly seek additional feedback from that point of view. Uh, another question here. Um, how should performance that varies uh, spatially and temporarily be assessed and rated? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I think I can pick up some of that. Um, I think it's it's quite obvious that there will, there will always be variations um, in energy use across across projects, be it ge with geographies. So something this would be different in here where I am in Edinburgh than it is in London in terms of energy use. Um, time, you know, that be it a building that's designed now or a building that's designed in, in 10 years time or even something we've been looking at resilience is a building design now and how that actually develops over time. So that building will look different in 10 years time because plant and equipment will, will start to fail and, and will need to be changed. So something that we we gathered from Strathclyde and one of their one of their briefs was a a a, a modeling system that that is consistent um, and and that assessment and rating system that that is consistent. And, and that that is seen in other modeling systems and rating procedures that we have and the, the, through the discussions that we had with the team and it's, it's all down to the inputs and so if if we want to assess how how the building changes over over geographies we, we just have to um have to input yeah, that into the model and something that again we, we gathered is is finding that consistent that 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 document or that piece of advice that that is that is out there in the market or out there in industry that that we, that we could use and so where, where we sort of left the project was and the input that we provided that was certainly there at the time it was it was in industry and then, then opening it up to industry now to get feedback um i'm not sure if that sort of answers the question but that was certainly where we where, where, where we left the project um it it, it, it does the British projects do vary um and it's trying to provide that consistent that consistent input um, which I think we, we sort of left the project of opening it up now to the market and open it up to industry. I think one one thing to add here is that they can certainly have um, you can certainly have metrics that incorporate spatial and temporal variation of performance. We you know that's not 
that's not that complicated, especially considering that the metrics that were considered, I mean, to be to begin with, the first things that we considered, of course, are all the things that already exist, you know, metrics that already exist, because the point of this exercise was not to develop new metrics. But <clears throat> resilience is fundamentally going to be measured sort of probabilistically. Um, and when you, you know, so it, it passes X percent of the time or whatever it is. Um, so it's completely conceivable to say, well, at least this percentage of the coverage of, of the area must pass this much percentage of the time. Um, and of course, as it evolves over time and you can build in wear and tear, um, I haven't done any explicit wear and tear modeling myself, but I know these, these things exist, you know, derating factors and stuff like that, which can change over time. And I think that's kind of one of the, 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 part, the steps forward that has been taken with this project and hopefully will continue is you, you don't just do it once under idealized conditions and say, it's all great. You also need to do what happens. You need to simulate what happens after the building and all the systems have been running for 25 years and lots of things have changed and wear and tear has happened in the meantime. Um, and if I could just add one thing about the previous question about you know doing different kinds of simulation, the the underlying engine for the proof of concept is ESPR at the moment. That's not to say ESPR is the only thing you'd ever use in this, but it's it's the place where we started, and that's already a modular software where you can add new computational modules to test different things, so long as you have the right information from the model. So of course, if you want to test a fire suppression system under different conditions, you need the relevant information, which at least in this panel, we didn't have the right um, expertise to then specify a fire suppression system for then Joe's team to model, because we are you know, in the thermal comfort, visual comfort, air quality side of thing. But that's already three different modules that we tested as Stuart pointed out. So it's, it's completely um, conceivable to have a module that gives you resilience to fire. The module that gives you the list of other things and so on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is quite a specific question, but how can projects include green roofs in their fabric efficiency calculations as they do in Austria and Switzerland? This just this follows on what from what Parag said, where the the expertise in the panel was on were on particular things, and it's a shame Joe has dropped off. Um, from what from what we gathered, that the model can be adapted, um, and if a green roof was to be put into the project, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure that could be um, I'm sure something we can get feedback from Joe. Would we'll just be built into the program and side of things, but I'll start with exactly. the Yes, uh, just just as Pat I mentioned there, a it's a it's modular and uh, conceivably. Uh, you could expand the modeling uh, uh, to, to incorporate many other aspects of building design. Uh, now, of course, there's a manageability issue eventually will start to come into this. I imagine Joe, Joe's better qualified to comment on that than us. But you know, these models are already quite big and they already take time and power to, mo to, uh, to, to run. Um, so the more you model, I'm guessing, the, 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 you know, the longer it will take, the more power it will require. But uh, Joe's, Joe's back online, so he's the, he's the person best qualified to talk to that. Uh, I've made some fundamental changes in my PC. Can you hear me now? It's still quite muffled, Joe. Um, it's still quite... Okay, I, I, I have to give up then. I made a fundamental change and I was hoping that would help. Okay. Apologies, Joe. Um, just another question here. Um, where are we? I'm just looking at some of these ones that have come through. Bear with me. Um, will some businesses be interested in delivering a service based on RTP technology? Do you see that from an adoption point of view further down the line? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I mean, they're all in um you know similar ideas uh, and businesses that exist um obviously nothing nothing quite in the same vein as the rtp but you know simulation in the cloud is a thing already um you can sign up for those and i think there is a, a tremendous business potential for all those you know maybe this panel is in a little bit of a bubble because we are so familiar with stratflight's work and we're so familiar with simulation that we think everybody uses simulation as a matter of course i don't think that's the case the average person, average building designer or specified does not use simulation. Um, they do what is 
the bare minimum legal requirement calculation to then you know um, lots of you know mechanical designers for example are not necessarily familiar with simulation so there is a uh, tremendous business opportunity to provide a service which takes in the models and the inputs that designers and specifiers already use and run the simulation in the cloud for them uh, you mm -hmm. know of course so long as it's sort of verified to say this is the the SIPSI resilience calculation that I'm running for you. It's not just some simulation I've made up of that on my own and I'll take it to the run. Excellent, thank you. If, if, I, um, if I could just, if I could yeah. just uh, pick up on, on Parag's point, because I think that's that's very, very good. The other thing that uh, certainly as an architect I'm always conscious of is uh, there's an expectation out there that uh, if you like a, a typical architect working in a in a typical practice could make use of those tools and have a keep themselves uh, with a level of expertise that you would expect within the industry so with tools like this as, as a resilience tool becomes developed it becomes available there would actually become an expectation that you would use it uh, I would hate to find myself in a, uh, being sued in a court and a barrister asked me, well, these tools existed and you didn't use them on this project. Why? And you go, well, yeah, actually, you're right. So, you know, the, the, there's two drivers there. There's the, the there's the driver in terms of what the, the tool delivers in terms of better buildings, but there's also the, the need for architects and designers to uh, ensure that they've taken every step that they possibly can or reasonably can to ensure that the, their designs work. Ideal. Um, it's a bit of an extension to that, actually, what you're saying there, Richard. Should the RTP um, approach underpin future building standards compliance? I think, as Stuart pointed out earlier, uh, there's a strong argument for that. I mean, in, in terms of how things get into technical standards, there's a there's a well known process in terms of exploring it and then bringing it in as guidance and then potentially bringing it in as standards. Uh, but if it Demonstrate if you can, if we can demonstrate that um, RTP is available and it's reasonably affordable um, and that it delivers robust answers, then there's no reason there's no more reason for it to not be part of a standard than SAP or SBEM. I mean, both of those are just complicated but non-complex algorithms that have been sort of taken off the shelf and used for compliance as other elements are. So. Yeah, absolutely no reason why not. Um, can BIM be evolved to accommodate the information of integrated building performance simulation? Yeah, I, I, there's already, I was going to say there's already efforts to do that. There have been for a while. I think the, the challenge has always been uh, accommodating time series information in BIM. Um, but that's not to say it can't be done. It just needs some... Um, I think the one of the issues is that people who do energy modeling and the people who do BIM come from different worlds and they are not the same people. And so it's you know it takes time for you know to, to the crosstalk to be actually useful for somebody. But yeah, certainly that's already happening. Right. Uh, Stuart, did you have anything you yeah. wanted to add? I, Parag more or less covered the point there. I was just about to say that yes, there are already efforts anyway for BIM models to be importable into dynamic simulation environments, so that you don't have to do the build, the, the construction of the model twice. Uh, those those who do this work will know that actually the time-consuming bit of it, from the operator's point of view, is actually constructing the building model in the first place. Once you've done that, the actual dynamic simulation runs in the background and spits out an answer after a while. Um, but the, the labour intensive bit of it is constructing the model and so the more portable these become and the more that you know you build one model for the one digital model of the building, a BIM model let's say, which then becomes, you can then drop into the simulation environment, it picks up on the geometry, it picks up on the fabric performance, picks up on all these other variables and is then able to simulate the operation of that building. That's kind of Valhalla <laughs> for, uh, for, for simulation in terms of the integration of BIM and other simulation tools. And um, uh, it's conceivable that it could be done. It, you know, that, I think there's no reason why it could not be done other than it's just quite a technically difficult thing to get right. 
uh, compatibility between different softwares is a uh, is well known to be an issue, uh, and and that would you would come up against that uh, and other things. Uh, but yeah, conceivably it could be done. Yes. In principle, yes. What's missing is a bridge, so to speak, between the two systems. Um, this is a question, I'll just put it out to the panel, um, if anyone can pick it up. Unlike other countries in the UK, the mainstream approach to HVAC system modelling still tends to be simplified in NCM methodology, with detailed modelling of HVAC systems typically seen in the NICE specialist service. This arguably is, is a leading cause for the performance gap. Could the resilience tool become instrumental in any way in bridging this modelling gap? Yeah, Parag, sorry. Keep, keep. I have to say, I have to say, I, so I, was, I, I did my training in the States where HVAC modeling is like the thing. Everybody has to do HVAC modeling in excruciating detail from my, for my uh, place. But, um, and you know, that's partly, it's a bit chicken and egg because there's so much uh, less usage of HVAC in this country. There's less incentive for people to learn to model it because there's not going to be that many projects where you use complicated HVAC. Um, that's changing, of course, because even residential developments in the south, for example, not so much up here, now incorporate HVAC just in residential, which was, you know, for the while it was unheard of. But I, it's, I think it's strange for me to hear that NCM is considered a modeling tool. It's a compliance tool. It's not meant to predict real performance. It was never designed for that. So you sacrificed um, accessibility for accuracy because you want people to be able to do it. Uh, so it has much, much wider cover. You know, very few softwares have the kind of coverage that SBEM does. It's, it's a fantastic coverage, right? Uh, but obviously the flip side is it has to be so simplified that all you get is like an asset rating, not a performance rating. Um, so I think that's one of the, well, at least to me, that's one of the big goals of uh, the, uh, something like RTP is you don't need to spend 500 hours tweaking all the settings to get it just right. You just give me your model. And then I'm just, I, as in the server is responsible for making sure that the settings are right. And of course, there will be compatibility issues. That's, you know, but if you can get it to 90% or 80% of the way where your model comes in and it's like, okay, can you change this, 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 and then I can run it? That's fine. Right now, we rely on a person downloading a fairly complicated bit of software and then running it just the right way to get the right uh, inputs and outputs. Um, I think the RTP is. Is, is, is to take it beyond and say, you work in the domain you work in, you still have to design the HVAC model to make sense, of course. If, if you don't know how HVAC is specified, then you're not gonna be able to model HVAC. That's, that's, that's not something the RTP can overcome, but it can certainly overcome the, the aspects that Stuart was just mentioning of the thousand and one things that had to be tweaked just right. Okay, excellent, thank you. Richard? If I can maybe pick up on that as well. Um... Uh, I mean, we have to remember, as I was saying before, I mean, the reason we have SAP and SBEM is at the time it was considered that simulation was too difficult and too expensive to do. And we're now 20 years on and we're, we're doing it, which is brilliant. Uh, but the other huge benefit I think that uh, uh, RTP can bring is uh, an ability to have a risk based conversation with the client and hopefully design out HVAC, demonstrate that a building doesn't actually need HVAC. Uh, and the reason I say that is we work, we live in a, we have a very risk averse um, industry. Uh, building anything is complex, things can go wrong, it involves risk. We're all quite reluctant to have a conversation with a client about uh, where, what's the boundary condition of, of our building, where will it fall over? Now that can vary from building to building. So for example, if you're building a, a nursing home or a hospital, it's inconceivable that you could have a situation where the heating goes off. So you'll, you'll put in two heating systems effectively to make sure that people don't get cold because that's absolutely mission critical. But if you're building something like a, a small community center, if it's too cold to use when there's six feet of snow outside, it doesn't really matter because no one would be going to the building to use it as long as it stays frost free. Now, it's very difficult to have those sort of risk based conversations with a with the client without some form of evidence. So the beauty of RTP is that you can model, as has been described, uh, your, your initial design, and you might come to the conclusion, yes, I've got a HVAC system, but it's only really there for you know, two day, the two hottest days of the year. 
do I really need to spend all the money on that HVAC system? Now, some buildings, yeah, you might definitely might need twice as much HVAC, HVAC, but most buildings you might not. So I think, you know, very, very powerful tool for those sort of conversations. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. If, you know, it's always difficult being a member of SIPC and going down the route designing out HVAC. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's a, it could be quite controversial, but some of what I've seen, I've only been in the industry 10 years, but as, as models get more complicated, it's going back to the original question about the performance gap, the performance gap seems to be getting wider. And it almost seems to be that we, we are designing these buildings so so complex or so in such a complicated way and the aspirations of these buildings and the market and what's actually being built it's just not being allowed to catch up and so there could be a wider discussion with building regulations going back to government bays and and, and the market in general i think we're slightly going off topic here but um always question the the need for really complex models um and and, and what they're there for I think there, there's, as Parag said, the NCM and, and the compliance is always needed, and that that model needs to be as, as simple as possible. In my in my in my, my my thoughts, but and it, it could be a separate discussion around the, the complexity of models. Um, are, are we making that performance gap a thing? Which, yeah, I think our aim should be trying to tighten it without widening it through these complex models. Scott, did you have something to add there? Yeah, just going back to that kind of question about performance gap, and I think what we need to focus on is how did we get to here? So we have, if you like, a, a building system, whether it's for domestic properties or for uh, non-domestic properties, you know, SPM and SAP. You know, these are in themselves iterative processes. So they have they have improved over years, but the original concept is derived from the time that that commenced. So we have derived the situation or the, the you know the, the purpose for SAP and SBM 20 years ago, maybe more. Yeah, you know, I think it's fairly clear that what we have now, whether it's driven by political will, whether it's driven by international agreements about things like climate change and whatever, we have a significantly different environment that's pressurizing buildings in a completely different way than it was 20, 25 years ago. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with SAP and SBEM in the way that they were designed for the purpose that they were designed for 20, 25 years ago. And we have continued to try to tweak those models to try and answer these you know, questions about performance gap as we go along. But what we're doing is trying to fix a thing that's essentially built for the wrong time. If you were to build you know, uh, you know, these tools now, SAP and SBEM today, then we would probably address all the kind of issues around about performance gap. The question was about, you know, can this process, you know, so the simulation process, can that help? Well, in some ways, no, because you're trying to fix the wrong thing. You know, so is there a way that we can look at going backwards before going forwards to say, are SAP and SVM fixable, given we know what we want to achieve? And where would we get that information from? How would we kind of source that information? I mean, we can't, you know, put simulate, we can't put, well, actually we can, put kind of monitoring devices, you know, lots and lots of them in buildings and try and gather some, you know, information about, you know, all of the factors that are in the simulation, or we use simulation. So simulation becomes the data source and the reasoning as to why we need to change some of the assumptions that we have built in and effectively rebuilding SAP and SBEM, which have to remain simplistic, as Parag saying, you know, we can't have very, very complex kind of front end kind of modeling like that. It's just not practical. But the question has to be asked about whether SAP and SBEM is something that can continue to be bolted on with uh, you know, uh, things that kind of maybe fix the performance gap, but there was something else you know, in the context that didn't quite kind of get fixed. You know, so we have to kind of rebuild the thing. That's, you know, I think that's probably, a, you know, as Daniel's saying, another kind of conversation. 
just the last question here, and I appreciate this is just one criteria, but just to make sure that there is a, a clarification and understanding from anyone that's attending today. How is the air weather impact accounted for on a continuous basis? So obviously that's one of many factors that are considered, but if you could just explain that in, 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 in you know, limited terms in, in terms of how that ties into the functionality of the RTP. I I can take that since I, I wrote the bit that deals with the weather for the first uh, model. Um, I take it to mean that this is like, you know, just weather and air, current air conditions. Um, um, the way, you know, uh, the, the dynamic simulation already accounts for weather conditions. That's the boundary condition in, within which dynamic simulation works. Um, and any dynamic simulation embedded inside RTP, so for example, right now at CSPR, would have a weather input. Now we are used to thinking of this as a weather file. That's a sort of outdated, slightly outdated concept from when you had to get, you know, tapes and stuff. Um, now you can have a dynamic engine, uh, like a sort of separate module that generates realistic weather and gives you lots of variation that says, do you still pass? Do you still pass? Do you still pass? Do you still pass if I give you an unusual heat wave? Do you still pass if I give you an unusual June? You know, and that's sort of one of the one of the aspects of resilience testing. That certainly, is to do with variations in weather, um, and you know, it's totally conceivable that you you can update the weather um, every every decade to ac accommodate the latest observations uh, if they are different from you know. I would seriously not recommend using web observations from the 60s and 70s now because they're not that valid anymore. Um, but this is a, I would say it's it's quite a core aspect, uh, boundary condition, and one of one of the two major stochastic aspects. So you know the RTP, one of the core ways in which it will differ from um, your um, compliance modeling is that it's meant to be stochastic. So you should never have a single condition. To test resilience against, you should always have a distribution of realistic conditions for that climate, for that usage type, you know, to test against. Excellent. Are we happy to round up there, uh, Stuart? To pass to you in terms of next steps with the project. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. Um, this proof of concept uh, has been successful, I think. I, it certainly has demonstrated that, in principle, the uh, the long term, uh, almost perpetual simulation of buildings with stochastic events being thrown at it, whether that be weather, whether it be occupation, whether it be failures of plant and equipment, and so on, as a concept, it has been proved that it can be done, and that you can set a set of parameters uh, for a pass fail um, result. Uh, after modelling over a very long term. So the, the idea that this could be done, I think it has been amply demonstrated, yes, it can. Um, so now that this proof of concept is complete, the, there is a question uh, which Joe has and, and the rest of us as to what, what happens next with this, what might be the potential to develop this into a tool that the industry would wish to use. And that's actually a question which we want to address to everybody who's listening, who has an interest in that. Um, SIBSI has formed a working group to uh, examine this and look at what potential ways in which this might be taken forward. Uh, there are several different models for how it might be done. Uh, for example, uh, Parag just mentioned that you know simulation in the cloud is happening now and can be done. So. Um, one way of doing it is for uh, an honest broker to be the host of the simulation environment for uh, others to submit their building models in an agreed format to that environment where the simulation will then be run and a result will come out the other end and they will get a badge potentially uh, as to how resilient their building is. Um, now, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it might be that, uh, again, if, if the compatibility between different building models and different so and, and current simulation software tools becomes an issue, uh, which is difficult, at least in the short term, to overcome. Another potential model might be 
sort of looking at the NCM approach. I don't, and I don't want people to fall off their chairs. I'm not talking about literally that, but what I'm talking about is the principle of it, where it may be that the resilience testing protocol become, uh, sorry, uh, I misspoke there, the resilience testing environment or platform becomes a set of protocols. So there's an agreed set of protocols, an agreed set of environmental conditions statistically, uh, an agreed set of other things that get thrown on a stochastic basis at the building within the model. And that different software providers can construct a resilience testing platform in accordance with an agreed set of rules and an agreed set of standards and run those. A, a bit analogous to the way that dynamic simulation software can incorporate uh, an, an NCM tool within it to provide a result which is theoretically meant to match the sort of result you would have got from SBEM, but using an, a, a dynamic simulation tool. So that's achieved through an agreed set of protocols and an approval that the simulation software does produce a result in accordance with an agreed set of rules. So that's another possible way in which this might proceed. Um, and, and someone would need to be the keeper of the rules and the stochastic data which would be used within that testing environment. So that's another way in which it might be done. So um, what we're interested in doing is, is hearing views from our industry colleagues in how they might use this, uh, how this might best be taken forward and what the most practical way to do it would be. And Joe's concept of this initially was his, his if you like, ultimate evolution of this would be that there is in fact a standard associated with resilience, just as there are standards associated with other things in the technical standards, and that your building gets a pass or fail in accordance with it. So that, that in some ways is the pole that's been set for the ultimate objective of this. If that becomes too difficult to achieve in a statutory sense, I can certainly see that there's plenty of scope for a voluntary scheme. I mean, there already are. There's Green Building Council. There are many other, BRIA, many other organisations who have produced standards uh, to which people aspire and want to get the badge that they have passed this test. It's not statutory, but it's a voluntary standard which people aspire to and, has, and, is, very, and is meaningful, is, is worthwhile to the industry. So that's another possibility, is that it doesn't actually become a statutory thing initially, perhaps, but it can be something that people would voluntarily wish to get and demonstrate to the, the, the design team might wish to demonstrate to their client that our building has achieved this standard and it has this badge on resilience. So that's another possible model for implementing this. Um, we don't have all the answers. What we want to do is explore with the industry what they think uh, the is the potential for this and what the most practical way forward might be. And this might happen in steps. There might be a first step a second step, a third step. Uh, it doesn't have to get to the end in the first leap. Um, so we're keen to have views on that. Uh, Joe has um, indicated that um, Strathclyde is uh, quite interested in hearing from people uh, who want to explore the possibility of offering a resilience testing prototype service on a, a, a commercial basis. So he, he's interested in that. Um, and he also is interested in hearing from people who might be interested in submitting to the current uh, prototype version uh, their building models to get some feedback on how useful it was, how, how useful they found that experience. And Ezru uh, could operate a server to support this possibility as well. So there's an opportunity there, even at this prototype stage, for others, the, the, the people on this industry group who participated in this project, were good enough to submit models of their own to the RTP for testing. And that was how we evolved it and how we found the glitches and, and the things that were useful or not so useful and refined it to the point it has at the moment. But that refinement process can still carry on a little bit even in this experimental stage. And Joe is offering the opportunity for people listening if they want to contact him to explore the possibility of modeling one of their buildings in this environment in its prototype form, he would be happy to hear from you. Excellent. Excellent. I think Fiona, that's probably my summary for now.
Perfect. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, and really just to wrap up uh, today's event, um, I just want to thank the audience for coming along today and for your important questions. Um, just to echo the points uh, Stuart's made, your participation, your ideas, um, there's plenty of opportunity for you to be involved in next steps. And within the chat function, we will add some links in terms of follow-up contact in addition to uh, other resources. So please keep an eye on that uh, just now. Um, and your feedback will be used to plan future events and initiatives. So please do also complete uh, the feedback form when it's received on the closing of the event. Uh, and just to offer a bit of an apology in terms of the technical issues we had uh, with um, with our other key presenter, Joe Clark. Um, it's, it's a shame. It, it's you know. Um, the, the mind of Joe is a wonderful thing, and we're sorry that we weren't able to share that with you in more detail today. But please rest assured that his expertise and experience will be um, applied in a pre-recording and sent round um, with uh, with uh, the event uh, recording, just to make sure that you have a complete event to reference uh, back uh, with. And, and as I said, I thank you again for coming along, um, and please do keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to the panellists as well for your time and expertise. Wouldn't have been here without you. So thank you. Well done on the project. Thanks, everyone.